Hello students, this is your Professor Dr. Mink, and welcome to the audio lecture for Chapter 6, titled Programming. We will uh, walk through some examples of top-down design, also referred to as stepwise refinement, and how those are implemented at the assembly and machine language level. Let's get started. All of you should be familiar with the concept of stepwise refinement, or I should say the process of stepwise refinement, especially if you had me for any of the prerequisite classes. It's how we um, convert a problem statement or set of requirements into an algorithm. And then we continue to break down each task into subtasks until they become trivial to implement in the programming language. And we're going to convert our algorithms into <clears throat> LC3 machine language instructions. Um, in this lecture, we'll also cover some debugging techniques to be used with the simulator. And <clears throat> we'll be focusing a significant amount of time on state transitions. And we will, with the simulator, be able to halt or should, I should say pause, not halt, pause the machine and examine a state snapshot, which is extremely useful in this class. Stepwise refinement, also known as systematic decomposition, is <clears throat> the process of starting with our problem statement or set of requirements, and then uh, decomposing that into uh, specific tasks um, that can be decomposed into very simple tasks that once again become trivial to implement using one of the basic constructs we're learning in this class, programming constructs. So eventually we will get from a problem statement into tasks and then subtasks and then even smaller subtasks until we get into actual instructions. One of the skills which are of paramount importance to programmers is the ability to interpret a problem statement written in English, for example, and then translating that into an algorithm and ultimately um, decomposing that into the subtasks, which then become easy to implement in a programming language. The problem is that most sets of requirements or problem statements contain ambiguity or incomplete instructions. Um, so the programmer then has to ask questions to translate that into a finite and computable set of requirements. You know, where is the file located? How big is it? How do I know when I've reached the end? How should the final count be printed? Is it a decimal number? So uh, it's a series of questions and answers that have to be um, well documented before the programming process can even start. We can decompose a task using one of the three basic programming constructs, and those are sequential, which is the standard linear flow of control. Do this, then do this, then do this, or execute subtask one, then subtask two, then subtask three, et cetera, et cetera. Or conditional, in which we test a condition, and if it's true, we implement subtask one. If it's false, we implement subtask two. And the third being the iterative or looping construct, where we test a condition. And if it's true, we implement a subtask and then go back and test the condition again. And we continue to implement the subtask, also referred to as the body of the loop, until the test condition returns false. We'll continue using the example of <clears throat> counting the number of occurrences of a character in a specific file and breaking it down into subtasks and then implementing those subtasks with 
uh, one of the three programming constructs. So we start with count and print the occurrences of a character in a file. And the first subtask is to get the character input from the keyboard and then examine the file and count the number of characters that match. We're going to break down that subtask into smaller subtasks using the iterative construct. And then ultimately, we would print the number to the screen. So further decomposing the subtask from the previous slide in which we examine the file and count the number of characters that match, we're going to break that down into testing a specific character uh, in the file to see if it matches the input character and then increment the counter if it does. Uh, we would use the conditional um, construct um, using a branch. I'm sorry, using a, uh, yeah, using a branch. And if the character that's currently uh, being examined matches the input character, we increment the counter and then we um, move the pointer to the next character and do it again. So I'm sure you saw where that was going from the previous slide. And I alluded to it um, in that we would do that comparison over and over and over again until we run out of characters or encounter the end of the file. And so that would be implemented uh, as part of an iterative subtask. During the stepwise refinement process, we will learn to convert problem statements into step-by-step -step descriptions of subtasks. So like a puzzle or a word problem, we're dealing with questions like, what is the starting state of the system? What is the de desired ending state? And how do we move from one state to the next? And we will develop an affinity for English words that correlate to one of the three basic constructs. You know, do A, then do B indicates a sequential construct. If G, then do H is a conditional, or for each X, do Y, or do Z until W are both indications of an iterative construct. So how do we use x86 or LC3 instructions to encode the three basic constructs? Well, sequential is obviously easy because instructions naturally flow from one to the next with the program counters um, flow of control being plus one. So we don't use any special instructions to go from one sequential subtask to the next. In order to implement a conditional or iterative construct, we need to manipulate the, um, the NZP condition codes. And we'll do that in a myriad of ways. So if the condition being tested is if the value in R0 is equal to R1, well then, we could subtract R1 from R0. And if it's equal, the Z bit will be set because we'll write the result of that subtract subtraction to a general purpose register, which will set the condition code. Then we can use the branch instruction to transfer control to the proper subtask when R0 equals R1. This slide depicts one particular implementation for a branch. The condition uh, for the branch, which is at B in um, the diagram on the right, the condition has to be generated in A um, prior to encountering B, which is the actual branch command. And branch commands opcode is 0000, and then the next three bits are the NZP codes. And the last 
uh, set of bits is the program counter offset. And in this example, the program counter offset would jump or reassign the program counter to C. So in other words, if the branch is taken or either of the NZP codes designated in the instruction are encountered, we will jump over subtask one. If not, we'll implement subtask one. And then we have an unconditional branch that will jump over D. So over to D, okay? So either we implement subtask one and jump over subtask two, or we jump over subtask one, implement subtask two, and then automatically, because we're back in a linear flow of control, implement D. In this slide, we examine the code for iteration, and this is a while loop. The condition is checked prior to executing the body of the loop. Notice we have an unconditional branch that is always taken that takes us back to whatever statements generate the condition which is tested in the first branch command. So uh, this will continue to execute the subtask at B as long as the condition is true. So once again, go back to our example of counting characters, okay? We start by initializing the machine. We put initial values in all locations that will be needed to carry out the task. We input a character. We set up a pointer to the first location of the file that will be scanned. We get the first character from the file. We zero the register that holds the count, okay? Then we scan the file location by location, incrementing the counter. If the character matches, we display the count on the monitor, okay? Um, so this is the initial refinement, a big task into three sequential subtasks. And then we will refine B further or decompose B further using the constructs we've been discussing in this lecture. So to further decompose step B, which was to scan the file location by location, incrementing the counter if the character matches, we implement a branch. And so we test a specific character. If it matches, we increment the counter, and then we move the pointer and we get the next character. So we'll further decompose B, we'll take that individual branch or conditional in which we're testing a specific character to see if it matches the character input by the keyboard. And if it does, we increment the counter and then get the next character. We'll add that into a loop or an iterative construct. And we will test each new character to see if it matches the end of file character which means we're done. And if we're done, we just move on to the next subtask, which would be to display the count of the number of characters which match the input character from the file. If we're not done, we go right back to our iterative structure and we implement the branch again and test the character if it matches, increment the counter, move the pointer, and we're off to the races. Here we have our last. And as we move towards the end of the stepwise refinement process, the subtasks have become so trivial that they're easily implemented in the programming language. And we'll just simply use comments to separate them into modules to document our code. We're going to spend the rest of this class writing programs. And the rest of this lecture will cover some debugging techniques and some tools 
that are built into the LC3 simulator, which will allow you to more efficiently uh, complete your programs and we'll be able to trace various components of your program, values and registers, condition codes, using these debugging techniques. Let's take a closer look. So the debugging environment of the LC3 allows us to display values in memory and registers, deposit values in memory and registers, and execute instruction sequence of our program. And we'll be able to stop execution when desired. I prefer to use the word pause. We're going to put a lot of breakpoints into our programs. Okay. Obviously, the different programming languages that you've used so far, which are most likely C++ and Java. Some of you may have taken Python here at the college, but they have um, source code debugging tools. Um, but for debugging at the machine at the machine level, okay, we have some monitoring tools and some simulators such as the LC3 that we're going to look at very closely. I just placed two videos in the module for this lecture in Canvas that demonstrate the use of a breakpoint. The first one sets a breakpoint based upon the condition code. And the second video sets a breakpoint based upon a program counter value. Um, that program counter happens to be the first instruction in a subroutine. And we haven't gotten to subroutines yet, but you'll see it's fairly intuitive how that works. I'd like you to pause this, um, this um, presentation and go look at those or watch those two videos right now and then come back. It's really important that you understand how to do this. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this PowerPoint when I've got live videos with live programs. Okay, thanks. I'll see you back here in a little bit. Although I'm presenting this material here, this absolutely is review for everyone in this class based upon the prerequisites for this class. There are three types of errors that you'll encounter in writing your programs, obviously syntax, logic, and data errors. And I'm not going to read this slide to you. And this is something you already have been assessed in. So there you go. Syntax, logic, and data errors. Here are, as our programs become more and more complex, with more function calls to subroutines and or system subroutines, tracing the program will become an invaluable skill. Um, you're going to have to master each of these components of the debugging process. Single stepping, executing one instruction at a time, keenly noting the state transitions. Okay, this is the smallest transition from one instruction to the next. It's tedious, but it'll be very helpful in seeing the transition changes from one state to the next. Breakpoints. Breakpoints are of critical importance. Okay, they'll let you stop your program when you want to stop it. Now, you could go through single stepping and not put any breakpoints, but that will be very wasteful and inefficient okay there's going to be components of your program that you know run and you don't need to step step through them and watch the state changes yet there's going to be other components of the program that maybe are demonstrating or exhibiting a logic potential logic or output error and you're going to want to pinpoint those so breakpoints let, let you quickly execute sequences to get to a higher level overview of the execution, execution behavior, okay? And you can quickly execute sequence that you believe are correct, kind of, I don't want to say skip over them, but not look at them step by step by step. Watch points tell the simulator to stop when a register or memory location changes or when it equals a specific value. So those are three very, very useful 
tools in the debugging process for machine language instruction or machine language programs. So once again, breakpoints were described in great detail in the video that I had you pause and watch a few slides back. So if you're here and you haven't watched that video, please go back and do it. You're not doing your job if you're here and um, you haven't watched those videos. Breakpoints define a condition which, when true, stop the simulator, pause the simulator from executing instructions. And you could set a breakpoint at a program counter value. You can set a, a breakpoint to watch a register. So, for example, when R6 is equal to hex 0000, it will break, I'm sorry, it will pause. You can um, set a breakpoint so that when a memory location holds a specific value in the example given in this slide, it's hex 300F holding a hex 5. So there is a myriad of options called breakpoints and watch points in the breakpoint menu that you should be uh, experimenting with now so you have an easier time debugging your programs. Now let's examine for the purpose of troubleshooting and debugging. We'll examine a program that multiplies two unsigned integers stored in register four and register five. And the values are, uh, are the values used for this example will be 10, a decimal 10 stored in R4 and a decimal three stored in R5. So 10 times three will give you 30, but we accomplish multiplication by simply adding R4, the value in R4, R5 times. So 10 plus 10 plus 10. And we're gonna use R2 as the accumulator. So we'll clear R2 and we'll add the value in R4 to R2, which will give us 10 the first time. And we'll decrement R5. So, and we'll continue to do this till R5 equals zero, or so we think. So after you do this, after you run this program, which is in the next slide, you'll see that R2 holds 40, not R, not 30. So let's take a closer look. Now, what I would like you to do is take this program and enter it into the, um, the editor, assemble it into object code, and put it into the, um, the simulator, and then using simulate, set values in R4 to 10, and set the value in R5 to three. And if you run the program, you'll see that we wound up, we wind up with the result in R2 as 40. So there's a couple ways you could go about doing this. Given that we already know the value that should be in R2, given the test data, R4 equals 10 and R5 equals 30, you could set a breakpoint so the program will pause when R2 equals decimal 30. And I'd like you to pause this video right now and go and do that. And then when the breakpoint is encountered, you could just run. If you set that up, you could just run. And then after the breakpoint is encountered, switch to step into mode. And you'll see the problem. Take a look and then report back. So if you were using step into mode the entire time, you'll see here is a really excellent state diagram of the program counter values, the value in R2, R4, and R5. And you could see that because we have a branch uh, on Z and P, we continue to branch adding value, adding the value in R4 to the accumulator, even when R5 is zero. So that causes us to add 10 an extra time. Take a close look at this um, 
this slide. In this example, they put a branch at the, uh, a, sorry, breakpoint at the branch. Uh, the recommendation I made, and there is no right answer in this example, the recommendation I made was given the test data, this program was to run with data solicited from the keyboard for R4 and R5, you wouldn't know. But given the test data, 10 and 30 in R4 and R5 respectively, we could set a breakpoint for R2 equaling 30 and then step, continue single stepping through the program to see where the problem lies. And here we have a corrected version of that program where we remove the Z condition from the branch. And you'll wind up with the correct answer in R2. Our next example will be a program that sums an array of numbers starting at 3100 and leaves the results in R1. I'm going to give you the code. I'm going to give you the fill array data in the next slide. And I'd like you to use uh, a breakpoint to debug this program on your own, offline, and then come back and um, we'll discuss the solution. Now, you can probably imagine I'm going to have the solution a couple of slides ahead of this. Learning to do this is not going ahead, getting that code, and getting it to run. I don't know what to tell you if, if that's your plan, but that's really not what this is about. And this is um, not a graded assignment. It is designed to help you work through these problems and implement breakpoints and uh, snapshots of the state of the machine to troubleshoot a program or debug a program that has issues. So here in this slide, I'm giving you the fill array data and a code file program that has um, it has an issue in it. It doesn't produce the correct results and uh, if this were a face-to-face -face class, we'd be doing this in class and troubleshooting it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to post this in the, um, the module for this uh, chapter as an assignment. And I'm going to have everybody change this code and submit it. So take a close look. The next slide gives you some, um, some hints. Stay tuned. This slide provides some very useful hints and it show as it shows the address and contents of that address. The program I gave you to start with when run with the array of data also given yields or ends with R1 holding hex 0024. However, the sum stored in R1 should be hex 8135. What happened? Take a close look. So to end or summarize our discussion on debugging, we learned some lessons. You have to trace a program to see what's actually happening within the programs. And in order to do that, you're going to need to set breakpoints and use single stepping mode after the breakpoints. The programs we're going to write, analyze, uh, decompose for the rest of this class are going to be too long to single step through the entire program. And they may have uh, iterative structures, constructs within them that call for, you know, 10, 20, 100, 1,000 iterations. So single stepping is not a viable solution to debug a program or it shouldn't be the only tool in your toolbox for debugging these programs. So when tracing, make sure to notice or actually verify what's happening, not what you think is happening. So in the summing program, it'd be easy to not notice that address hex 3107 was loaded instead of hex 3100, big hint. Test your program using a variety of input data. As we get into I.O., 
we'll be able to solicit data from the user and we won't have to artificially place data in an array as we've been doing for you know the past few weeks so that's all of course if you have any questions don't hesitate to contact me and i'll help you understand any of the concepts or tools and techniques that we discussed in this lecture thanks for watching have a great day